Welcome to video 27 in our series on tensor calculus. Today we're going to derive transformation equations for partial derivatives. This is something we're going to need as we work toward developing tensor calculus expressions that involve partial derivatives. Here we have an expression for the divergence as it relates to Cartesian coordinates. Now the divergence is symbolized either this way or this way, depending on what literature you're looking at. Now, by way of introduction, the divergence is a scalar function, a scalar quantity that's a, a function of the point within our space that uh, measures the increase or decrease of whatever quantity is being represented by our vector field. Okay, now, um, if we have a small space like this, and we have vector quantities that are passing into the space like this and out of the space like this, then the question is, what is the net result? Uh, how do the inflow compare to the outflow? We'd say that if the, there's more flowing into the space than flowing out, we'd say that the divergence is negative, and we'd refer to the area as a sink. If we have a situation where something is flowing out of it like this, then the divergence is positive, and we'd say that it's a source. Now, the divergence has important applications in things like fluid uh, dynamics. You know, as we measure the flow of an incompressible fluid, we'd expect the divergence to be zero at any given point, because any given area of, in our space, uh, the, the flow of the fluid into that space has to equal the flow of the fluid out of that space at any given period of time. Um, it also has important applications uh, related to electricity, magnetism, and gravitation. Now, our goal for this video is to see if we can develop an appropriate expression in tensor calculus for the divergence. And um, in keeping with the strategy that we discussed before, what that really means is we want to see if we can take this expression and uh, modify it so that it becomes a tensor equation. If we can express this as a tensor equation, then we'll have an invariant expression that's valid for all coordinate systems. So let's see how that might work out. The first thing we'll do is to uh, express x, y, and z as uh, indexes. Um, you know, t x is 1, y is 2, z is 3, and so on. So we'll see if this works out. We'll do the partial derivative of t1 with respect to z1. z1 is just x, of course. And then uh, the partial of t2 with respect to z2. And the partial of t3 with respect to z3. Okay, looks like a good start. But there's a problem here. You'll notice in the, that we have indexes uh, on the bottom here. These are lower indexes. Anytime we take a partial derivative, we're introducing a covariant index. So the indexes along the bottom are covariant indexes, but I've also written down the components of T as covariant components, which means that we have two covariant components in this expression. In other words, uh, I've got something that might look like uh, this, But because these are both lower indexes, we know this doesn't work because uh, you can't have a contraction with the indexes both on the bottom of the expression. But then we remember that in Cartesian coordinates, our component Tx can not only be represented as a covariant component, but it can also be represented as a contravariant component like this. And with that in mind, we could have written the expression this way. Instead of using Tx as a covariant component, we'll make it a contravariant component like this. And the expression uh, expands out like so. Now if we did that, then um, this looks like it has a lot of promise because now our expression in tensor calculus could look like this. 
here we have an expression with two indexes, one in the upper position, in the contravariant position, one in the covariant position. Thus what we have is a fully contracted expression that uh, results in a single expression, and it's fully contracted, which means that it is an invariant expression, and most importantly, when we expand it out, we get this as a result in Cartesian coordinates. So does that mean we have a valid expression for the divergence that's applicable in all coordinate systems? Well, the answer is we're still not sure. And the reason is because there's one other test that we have to, to look at, and that is, do we really have a tensor equation? In other words, is the partial derivative of Ti with respect to Zj a tensor? If it's a tensor, then we've got what we want. But if it's not a tensor, then this will not work. So to answer that question, we're going to have to uh, derive the transformation equation for a partial derivative. So to find the transformation relationship for the partial derivative, we'll start with what we know. We know that Ti transforms as a contravariant object, which means that if we had the value in the Z prime system, we'd need to apply a contravariant transformation to get its value in the unprimed system. So we need a transformation that looks like this. Now let's take the partial derivative of both sides of this with respect to zj. So here we have ti with respect to zj like so. And of course we'd have the same thing on this side. We take the partial with respect to zj of our expression ji i prime and t i prime like so. Now, we really want to be uh, taking the derivative on the right side with respect to zj prime, uh, not, not zj. Now, if we want to do that, we could treat our expression here, this product, as a function first of all of z prime, then of z, and that would allow us to use the chain rule. So our expression would evolve to this, partial of zj prime with respect to zj times the partial with respect to zj prime times our expression. And, and let me just make sure you understand what I'm doing here. We're saying that this represents this because this is the chain rule if we treated this as a, a function of z prime, then a function of z. So these two values inside the circles here are equivalent to each other. OK, so with that in mind, I'm also going to expand out. If you remember the definition of the Jacobian, this is the partial derivative of zi with respect to zi prime. That's just the definition of our Jacobian factor and then times ti prime like so. Therefore, this expression on the right is what we need to expand out to get our transformation. OK, then we'd have the partial of ti with respect to zj. It's going to be equal to our first factor here, the partial of zj prime with respect to zj. And then to expand this out, we're going to need the product rule. First of all, we'll take the partial with respect to the first term, holding the second fixed, and so on. So if I take the partial with respect to the first term, uh, that's actually going to become a second derivative, second derivative of zi with respect first to zi prime, then z j prime, and our factor here just remains as is in the first term. Then uh, you hold the first term fixed, partial of z i with respect to z i prime times the partial of t i prime with respect to z j prime, like so. 
All right, we're making progress here because what we're really trying to do is to compare this term with this term. Um, the partial of Ti with respect to Zj compared with the partial of Ti prime with respect to Zj prime. Okay, now um, you'll remember, I mean, obviously you'll recognize that this is really J, J prime, J. And of course this is J, I, I prime, like so. Well, we're going to introduce uh, something new in the syntax convention here. We're going to represent this double, um, this second order derivative as J, I, I prime, J prime. So this, the syntax will be that when you see a double index on the bottom of the Jacobian like this, it's going to represent our second derivative that, that looks like this. So with that in mind, we can now rewrite the expression as follows. So all I've really done here is to reorganize the terms a little bit. This guy is right over here now. And this one is right here. Then uh, this expression and this one are here and here. And of course, I've distributed this term here and here. All right, so what is it that we've got here? Well, um, if the equation only consisted of this first term right here, then we'd have the perfect expression for a tensor transformation. We've got a dummy index here that matches the upper index there, dummy index here that matches the lower index here, and these two guys match the free indexes on the other side. So that's a, a very valid um, tensor transformation equation. But we have this extra term. And what that means is that the transformation for a partial derivative of a contravariant object is not a tensor because it does not have the required transformation expression. And that in turn leads to the fact that we have to conclude that the divergence of T is not equal to the partial of Ti with respect to Zi. It looks so promising at first, but it's just not to be. And we're going to come up with a solution for this problem in the next video. But before we end this one, there are a couple more things I want to do. First of all, I'd like to derive the transformation equation for the partial derivative of a covariate object. So let's do that next. We'll proceed along the same lines as before. We'll start with what we know about our component, and that is that as a covariant component, it has to transform using a covariant transformation rule. So this is the way our component transforms between the Z prime system and the Z system. Now let's uh, take the partial derivative of both sides with respect to Zj. And that's going to require the product rule on the right-hand side. So if we start by taking the partial with respect to Zj of the first term, and using our new syntax, all that is is just j i prime i j. It's the second partial with respect to i first, then of j. Of course, this uh, factor remains unchanged. And now we'll take the first factor unchanged. And now um, I'm taking the partial with respect to z, but I really want to use the partial of, of zj prime. So for that, I've got to introduce a, um, a chain rule here. So I'll insert a factor like this, partial of zj prime with respect to zj, and then we'll have the partial of ti prime with respect to zj prime. Now, just so we're clear on what's going on here. 
these two terms together are the same as the partial of t i prime with respect to z j. We're simply using the chain rule so that we can take the derivative with respect to z j prime, which is what we need to do. Okay, now given this, we can now rewrite the expression as follows. Now all I've done here is to move this term over here and this term over here. And of course, this factor is nothing but the Jacobian j prime j. So uh, once again, what we notice is that if we're only looking at this much of the equation, if this all there were, was to it, then we have the perfect transformation for a tensor. We've got dummy indexes between i prime and i prime here. They're both lower indexes. And j prime with j prime here, uh, all of these are lower indexes in this term. They pair with the upper indexes here. And the two lower indexes here pair with j and i as the free indexes on the other side. So it's all perfect as a tensor transformation, except that we have this additional term. And because of that, we have to conclude here as well that the partial derivative of a covariant um, vector component is not a tensor. All right, now the last thing I want to do is to see how um, the partial derivative of a scalar function transforms. Here we start with a scalar function t, which is a function of z. And of course, as a scalar function, by definition, it's got to be the same thing if we express it in the z prime system. And z prime, of course, is a function of z. So we're going to take the partial of t with respect to z i this time. And that's got to be equal to the partial of t first over here with respect to z i prime. Then we need the partial of z i prime with respect to z i, like so. And thus we can rewrite the expression as the partial of t with respect to z i being equal to the Jacobian i prime i times the partial of t with respect to z i prime. OK, now what you're looking at here is nothing but just a straightforward covariant transformation. That, in turn, tells us that we have a tensor equation. The form of this equation is uh, that needed to prove that we have a tensor. We've got a, a uh, dummy index here on this side. We only have one index, so we only need one Jacobian factor. And this free index matches that one. So we do have a tensor. So the ultimate conclusion is this, that the um, partial derivative of a scalar function does transform as a tensor. But the partial derivative of vector components, either covariant or contravariant, do not transform as tensors. So with that, we'll take a break and go do a quick recap. In this video, we discovered that the partial derivative of a scalar function transforms as a covariant transformation. And that, in turn, means that these objects, the partial derivatives of a scalar function, transform as a tensor. However, we also discovered that that's not true for the partial derivatives of either a contravariant or a covariant vector component. We found these transformation rules. We ran into these additional terms out here, which means that these objects do not transform as a tensor. Now, that in turn means that we ran into difficulty when we were trying to develop an expression for the divergence. It's also going to mean that we're going to run into similar problems for any expression that involves a partial derivative of a vector component. So this is a problem that we're going to solve next time when we introduce a new operator called the covariant derivative.